thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on a beautiful movie. Um, I think we should probably start at the beginning with Shawnee because I believe you've been working on this project in some form or another for 20 years. Can That's you sort true. of tell us how you first became aware of the story and what you know made you want to tell it? Well, I met one of these amazing women probably 25 years ago, and I always thought, wow, that's an, just an amazing story. How come we haven't heard, it, heard of it? And then some few years later, I actually was introduced to the community and um, w was granted entree into, the, into their community and, and promised that if they let me tell their story, that, that I would finish it. And we never thought it would take 20 years, of course, but <laughs> sometimes that's the nature of documentaries. And Pedro, how did you come to be involved? Because I believe it was more like six years ago, which is still a yeah. long time, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was uh, 2015, the fall of our, uh, 2015. Um, I was working on uh, a film called Bend in the Ark with um, our other amazing producer, Judy Corrin, over here. Um, and uh, Kira and Shawnee um, approached me with um, this incredible story and these treasure trove of just the most astounding um, first-hand accounts that uh, Shawnee uh, did with the, these extraordinary women. And so uh, I immediately as a, I immediately fell in love. It, it just, I said it was like an arrow through my heart. And as a, as a, as growing up Catholic in Brazil, um, their imagination to see beyond the, the structures and mm -hmm. the institution was just so powerful and really resonated with me. Uh, in a very personal way. Um, and so I, I knew I had to help tell the story in any way I could. Um, so I came on board and dragged Judy with, uh, with me. I mean, it is an amazing story. And Rosa and Lenore, I'm curious, had anyone ever approached you before about wanting to tell your story, either in a documentary or even, you know, a, a, a fictionalized version of events? Uh, not in a documentary film. Well, there are there is footage made by other companies, BBC, and um, but books have been written, and I've been interviewed, you know, for articles and books about the community. But this is the first uh, full-length documentary. And what was it about Shawnee that you know made you put your trust in her? <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, it was our first meeting, and a friend, Lorraine Duraco, introduced her. Lorraine is a former member of the community, and it was Lorraine's love for the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart, of which she was one, that um, and made her um, want to tell Shani, you've got to meet this community and make a film. So I think it was our trust and Lorraine, who led Shawnee to us. And then over the years, of course, our trust and our love for Shawnee grew mm -hmm. as she persisted um, with bumps in the road. So, but Lorraine was the one we really trusted because she had been a member of our community. And Rosa, for you, was there any hesitation in you know, telling your story and you know, did, did, did you ever think it would actually happen? 20 years is a long time. Well, well who, who projects 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> well, the result is a very pleasant surprise. And as far as hesitation is concerned, well, not really. My way of thinking was that all these years, um, there's been a lot that has been said about the community in print, on film, in interviews, um, but really talking to the community and, t and presenting the community story itself on film, I had not seen that before. And in book form, Anita, um, Witness to Integrity, is the only um, thing in print that I know of that um, really tells our story, doesn't just talk about us, but gets to the heart of who we are and asking us and reporting who, um, to, to the world our story and who we are and what our hopes and dreams are. 
And Shawnee, I, I mean, I am amazed in this industry that any movie ever gets made, knowing what it takes. Um, but can you talk a little bit about why it did take 20 years? A couple of reasons. Um, some were internal with the, the community itself. They went through a lot of their own growing pains. And so I was in and out of um, favor, so to speak, throughout over the last 20 years. Um, and, but then it was also funding and finding the right team to really be able to bring it to fruition. And I think that was ultimately, it was the right time. Um, you know, it was a hard sell, a story of nuns, even though they were these amazing feminist, you know, avant-garde women who were so courageous. Um, it, it was, the times have kind of come back around where we're, you know, witnessing and experiencing some of the same issues that they did back then. And then it was meeting Pedro and Kira and Judy, who were this amazing team and had these amazing connections. We were able to put together the funding for it and the creative team, and it was just the right time, I think. So. Pedro, where did you even start? Because Shawnee came to you with existing footage, correct? And so, I mean, I don't know how much there was and how you were envisioning this film. What, what was sort of the first step? The first step was uh, just trying to basically bathe myself in, in this material and uh, really absorb as much as possible. Uh, Shawnee did over 50 interviews with the um, original, a um, lot of the original women that, that lived through this time, and, and men and all, as well, you know, who, who witnessed the, the whole journey and the transformation. Um, but one of the things was that. Um, Shawnee also be, really began amassing this mountain of a treasure trove of archival. Um, you know, there were extraordinary filmmakers who were filming at the Immaculate Heart College at that time. Haskell Wexler, the renowned uh, cinematographer, was, you know, you see his footage in, in here. He was filming at the college. Bayless Glasscock, um, Thomas Conrad, these were incredible filmmakers who were drawn to this. Um, to this hub, to the center of intelligentsia in the 1960s that was the Immaculate Heart College. And this is thriving um, community. Um, and they were, you know, there's beautiful, not only from their films, but the student films Lenore was filming back then, as we see, right. uh, uh, um, you know. And, and so we, it was a process of getting uh, the landscape and reading Anita's book, Witness to Integrity, which was also essential, really sort of guided us, was really guiding light for us in, in the edit room. And just surveying and beginning to search for more. Um, you know, I, I get greedy with, uh, with materials and, um, and finding more and really then beginning to film some more. I think one of the things that as, as Shawnee has spoken about, uh, as time went on, the story just became more cu current and more contemporary. And it was really about grounding it in the present, seeing that the Immaculate Heart community still, Rosa, Lenore, and the community members are still out there. They are going to Nogales, as you see in the film. They're going to the border to march for immigrant rights. They're going to the immigrant detention centers. They are going marching in women's rights. They are taking part of the movements today because the movements today are very much continuations of movements of the time that you see them taking part in in the 1960s. Civil rights, the farm workers, the laborers movement, um, women's... Um, liberation, every, it's, it's like we're, it's, you know, 50 years later, but a lot of the same fights. And I thought it was integral to kind of spark the imagination of possible partners to really ground it and show what the story actually means and why it's so much about today um, as well. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big believer in things happen when they're meant to happen, so although I'm sorry it took 20 years, <laughs> I mean, it resonates so much today. And how do the two of you sort of feel about that? I mean, you've made so much progress on one hand, and then on the other hand, you're still having to fight these fights. Do, do, does it ever get frustrating? Well, um, that's because we've become part of the world. And so in the original context, the war was going on, civil rights movement was happening, and racism is rampant today. You know, we are looking at what's happening to Haitians um, and intervening in other countries. So w being members of the whole world and concerned about suffering in the world um, 
happened because we opened our doors, as the Vatican Council said. So the, the circumstances are similar to what we were going through, and change is constant. So I think that's you know, part of the theme of the film. We hope some things in this country would change, and we're working toward systemic uh, racism and changing systems that are still rigid politically um, in, and in the church and in society. So um, I think Corita says in the beginning to change is to grow. Mm -hmm. And through the years, we have grown, we have changed, the world has changed. So there are some similarities to history, but um, the issues continue, and we continue to be part of working for change and growth and justice and peace. I mean, um, someone actually says it in the, in the film that you, know, you could feel when this was happening, it, it was something special. A lot of people don't realize when they're, you know, when they're making history while they're making it. Um, but Rosa, did you sort of, could you feel it you know, when all of this was taking place? Did you know you would reverberate throughout decades? Well, I knew that Immaculate Heart and the, my teachers um, were people that I loved. And because I didn't have anyone else, it wasn't until um, my high school was closed by Cardinal McIntyre. And I ended up in my last two years of high school at a very, very, very traditional Catholic high school where they were still doing the mass in Latin with the priests back to you. Um, and where those of us that came from the school that was closed, we were actually targeted as those girls who had those nuns and those teachers. Then I realized, oh, the world's different from what I came from, but I'm not giving it up. And I think that one of the impacts also of um, our community and our community's history is the planting of seeds in society, which we don't necessarily see in our lifetime, but which suddenly happen, we see them bloom. Um, there's still a lot of other stories concerning that time um, that are, are outgrowths of the community itself. Stories like our friend, um, Bishop Remy DeRue, who is really the only bishop who stood by the community. And if I understand correctly, Lenore, I think the Vatican let him know that's as far as you're gonna get. You're never gonna get the Cardinal's hat for having stood by us, at least that's what I heard. Or someone like John August Swanson, a wonderful uh, um, artist, if you haven't heard of him, Google him. He passed away recently, and Corita's um, influence on him is so obvious. Yeah. Or the girls from Queen of Angels High School, what they went on to do with their lives, and those that we have also at Immaculate Heart High School, um, some very powerful women have graduated from the high school, including Meghan Markle. Really? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we have a princess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to talk about the music in the film, um, and especially, I guess, Rufus Rainwhite. Rain, Wayne, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble pronouncing last names today. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have trouble pronouncing his, his last name as well. <laughs> but the song Secret Sister is, is so, so powerful. Yeah, and it actually comes from a really personal place because he had a personal connection to, to the story. Rufus's, I think, great aunt, if I'm not mistaken, um, or it was his grandmother's sister, so yeah, a great aunt, um, was uh, was connected to to the community to the to the order actually, and he was really um, he felt um, so connected to to that side of the family and to that struggle. It, he said that the song really just flowed out of him in basically a, a, a you know very little time, and once we heard it, we 
we heard a little bit, you know, Tracy McKnight, our extraordinary um, magician, music supervisor. I always say, um, Tracy McKnight making dreams come true every day. <laughs> um, you know, like from Nina, the likes of getting Nina Simone and Patti Smith and all these extraordinary songs that we were able to license, that's because of Tracy. And Tracy was also uh, thought that Rufus would connect. Little did we know that he had this personal connection. Mm -hmm. And once he sent us the demo, we were just floored. We were like, well, the, the, the mic drop. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, that was it. <coughs> and, um, and it's, yeah, every, it, it just, it's such a powerful um, meditation at the end of the film mm -hmm. that really kind of, I think, embodies the, the journey um, in a beautiful, poignant, and yet celebratory way. What about the song Rebel Hearts? That actually the plays during the film. First Aid Kit. That was, um, uh, love that. It's a Swedish band called First Aid Kit. They are extraordinary. That was part of their album a few years ago. Um, our editor, uh, Yanni Villani, was a fan of theirs. And we were looking for, uh, you know, the because these, these songs really bring uh, a help bring to life a, a feeling and a setting not only the mood but the emotional resonance of their journey and we wanted something that felt empowered like that that was when they really you know put past their decrees they're basically their quote unquote constitution and so they wanted something that felt very current and modern and had a beautiful strength and that happened to be that rebel heart and Yaniv when, when Yaniv found that song we were just I was like oh my god Yaniv that is brilliant uh, and so we that was uh, and we were able to license that song as well and um, yeah it's, uh, it's one of my favorites for sure oh it's great um, I heard about this film when it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival this year and the response was just so rapturous <laughs> truly and, and, and overwhelming uh, have you been surprised by the response to this movie? Um, it's been, you know, so long in the making, and now your story is being told. Um, how does it feel for the two of you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it's it's a surprise. It also feels really good. Um, part of the orientation uh, into the community for quite a while has been um, viewing the films that the BBC did way back when. And when I came into the community and I saw that film, I just had a bittersweet feeling of, well, you know, but that was in the past, nostalgia, wish it was like that. And too many films and, that I had seen or photographs gave me that feeling. And this was the first film where I felt really happy, like, okay, now the story's being told. Now it's alive. Now the truth is coming out. So that was great. And surprised um, hearing from people who are seeing this film that I least expect to be seeing this film. Um, last night I was sharing with, I was sharing right now with Judy um, that last night for the first time I was on a Zoom call with the social action committee at my parish, Dolores Mission. And um, it's in Boyle Heights, Spanish speaking community. The meetings are done in Spanish. And um, a small parish, pretty humble. And haven't been down there in almost 19 months because of quarantine. And when I was seen on the Zoom, I could hear at least two people say, no, it's Rosa, it's Rosa. And one person started saying, you were in that film. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> uh, and there's a reason for the oh, no. And they were explaining to some of the other people in Spanish what the film was about. And they wanted to know, can we see it in Spanish? Where is it? And one of the people said, it's a really good film, was one of the priests. And um, for me, it's kind of like, oh boy, <laughs> oh, let's find out if the archbishop has anything to say if it goes all the way back to that office, which I think it might have. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> wow. Lenore, for you? Well, um, there's much in the film that I really didn't know about. Um, 
although we were informed along the way, but we didn't know many of the details. So um, Shani has, through going through the archives, and Pedro also, has much more um, knowledge just from reading that we didn't have access to. I love the film because um, I w lived at the mother house. So the major players were my friends, Anita, Helen Kelly, Corita and I were in the art department together and traveled together. I went with her to exhibits, and so we were close. Um, Pat Reef. So because we were colleagues and friends, they came alive for me in the film. And um, they were all, then and now, inspirations mm -hmm. for um, being women of conscience, speaking truth to power, working for justice. So it's not just a, a sentimental look back, but an ongoing motivation to carry on the groundwork that they modeled for us. Absolutely, and, and Shawnee, I mean, you've lived with this project longer than anyone, except, you know, obviously the people here. <laughs> what is it like for you to finally see it out in the world? So beautiful, yeah. It was always my dream for the woman to be able to stand up in front of an audience and get a standing ovation. I thought they deserve to be acknowledged for all their courage and all they did. So I'm grateful for the ones who are still with us and honored and humbled by this team that made it come alive. It was always a dream for it to be here. So thanks to Pedro and Judy and Kara and, and Eleanor, who was one of the few people who stood with me for the last 22 years. Yeah. It's such a beautiful movie. If you want to see it again, it's on Discovery. <laughs> um, so you can watch it again and again. I want to thank you guys for being a great audience. And thank you all so much for being here today. And again, congratulations. Thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.